Hello, and welcome to the webinar titled How to Read a UL Listing for Penetration Firestop Systems, provided to you by the International Firestop Council. My name is Brent Johnson, and I will be your presenter today for this webinar. Our focus of this short amount of time is to make you aware that there are thousands of different types of listed systems specifically for protecting penetrations through rated barriers. This task to fully understand each and every system out there can be a daunting task. So the focus of this webinar is to pick one specific example of a common field condition you may be faced as a designer, installer, contractor, or inspector, and help you understand the common terminology that is found within these systems, how much information goes into them, and how each one is different to help you better select, install, and inspect to these imperative documents concerning Firestop. So with that, our exercise was to take a single listed system. In this case, we selected WL3065. I downloaded it directly off of Underwriters Laboratory's website, which is a free service that you can do, or the manufacturer also many times provides them on their website. And I would like to just kind of walk through what's found in this. Uh, for people new, there's gonna be a good amount of terminology that may never have heard before. And for those experienced people, we're still gonna cover common terminology you see on a day-to-day -day operation, but make you aware that no one part of this system is more important than the other. Well, Brent, I'm just focusing. Look how pretty my Firestop installation is. Well, there are a lot of steps prior to the installation of the Firestop that we need to vet as a design professional, inspector, or installer per these listed systems. So in this case, WL3065 is just you know, a, a very versatile system that allows a lot of different configurations from you know, sleeves with cables, low voltage or electrical, potentially just bare cable themselves, or you know, smaller sleeves or penetrations. So again, we're trying to say, hey, this is a very common application. I see it on every job. This system maybe can come in handy. Thanks, Brent. But you know, what's behind the scenes of all the paperwork and what's the requirement to meet code requirements and to do a proper installation? So there is a whole separate video series and terminology how to read the nomenclature of a Firestop system. In this case, W for wall, L for framed wall, and three is a, the cabling system and the 65th cabling system. So right away from my photos, I'm able to match up and say, yep, I got cables. I'm not sure the type of cables yet and what the system says, and it's going through a wall. I'm not really sure what type of wall, but I can get pretty close just from that nomenclature. It gives me a date when the last time the system was updated. And then right at the top of the page, it says I meet the code requirements listed that the manufacturer shall test to. So again, the ASTM and UL standards we find in the code are listed right at the top of the page. So right away, I know I'm on the right track of a code compliant listing. Then we see an F rating and a T rating. So again, I have to match that up with my barrier to verify that I'm in the right area and it's acceptable for a one and two hour wall assembly. We have additional ratings that may be required by code. And remember, an L rating is optional. And as you can see here, two different measurements, ambient, room temperature, and at 400 degrees. So if my barrier is a smoke barrier, I may need to be doing additional calculations here to make sure this system is acceptable for use in that smoke barrier. Uh, I also like to show this because, as you can see, not the same number. The product is not holding the smoke value or L rating in this case the system does, and it's different for every system. On the right side, please remember that listings now by Underwriters Laboratory uh, provide Canada and United States standards. So I'm discrediting in this video or this webinar on uh, the Canadian standards, but many times the system includes both, just so you know. So now I find a drawing. As please remember from your studies that the drawing provided by the laboratory is just an example. It's not to scale, and it does not show every single condition available to us. So please remember the words in the listing always trump the drawing or the photo or any sort of sketch. I like to show this one as a great example because number two shows a sleeve going through a wall. And if I go down to number two, I see right away optional. So just because the drawing showed a sleeve, the verbiage said optional, meaning I don't have to have a sleeve. So this is a good way to start to see I have a sheetrock assembly of some kind. I have some sort of cables going through a wall. 
I may have a sleeve and it looks like I got some sort of sealant or fire stopping putty material here, but no longer anything in the stud cavity. So that that's, looks pretty user friendly to start, but let's read the fine print. So it starts to talk about a wall assembly and often overlooked is the construction of the wall. Brent, I'm not the framing inspector. I'm not the uh, fire marshal. I don't look at the wall assembly. Well, that's understandable, but we still need to verify that the most stringent design is being followed here. So this listing says any one or two hour rated gypsum wall stud assemblies. It even goes further to say you can use these hundreds of different types of wall assemblies provided by UL. All different types of assemblies, they have their own test standard and their own system to install and inspect to. That should be done prior to fire stop installation. Someone else has to verify all of that. So where I'm going with this is though, we might not get into the, the nuts and bolts of the system of the wall, but we still need to verify that the stud, see it says steel stud to be minimum two and a half inches or wood nominal two by four, that that was the construction used. So if I had a four inch or three and five eighths metal stud, I'm good to go. This has minimum two and a half inch metal stud. That's pretty narrow or shallow. We usually don't see that level of uh, depth or that minimum of depth in a system. That's why again, user friendly system, but we're just checking off that box. So if you don't know that question, please just ask the building official or inspector who's focusing on that. Hey, uh, can you verify the stud depth? If the stud cavity is open, it's a simple measurement just to match, uh, put a measuring tape in that stud cavity and verify it's acceptable. Then it talks about the sheetrock. There's all different types from half inch, five eighths, three quarters, one inch board. All I'm trying to do is, uh, okay, what specific depth of sheetrock did you use here? And make sure it matches up here. It also gives us the diameter of opening. So when a sleeve is used, max five and a half inches of opening. When no sleeve is used, I can only do a four inch opening. So the whole size itself is called out under the gypsum board section, and it's limited based on the penetration type. Then it says sleeve, and I like focusing on this because many people say, Brent, it's a sleeve. I use a sleeve, leave me alone. Why are we talking further after that? Well, let's see what the system says. Nominal four inch, so it limits us to a four inch sleeve or smaller. Then it says it could be an EMT or a schedule five, so pretty heavy pipe sleeve, or a 28 gauge sheet metal sleeve. So okay, it does give us a couple different types of sleeves. Well, looking at it, if uh, you know some of us, it's pretty hard to understand what it is. I do this every day, all day, and I still don't want to put my name on what a sleeve is. So electrician, uh, whoever put the sleeve in, low voltage contractor, can you please identify what that sleeve is, how long it is, how it's supported potentially, uh, and all the elements you are required to follow per code for electrical code and supporting that or your local building code. So then it says the angular space between the sleeve and the periphery of the opening shall be minimum point contact to max one inch. So again, that measurement is from the outside of the sleeve. So if I walk on a project and this is what I see, I cannot make that measurement. Sure, the fire stop looks pretty. Hey, looking good. Uh, but that measurement's right here from the sleeve to the wall. It could be, maybe it's tight all the way around. Maybe it's one inch all the way around. Maybe it's greater than one inch. I, I don't know. But I can only touch on one side because the word point contact was used, not continuous point contact. So if these sleeves were cut tight all the way around, that could have been a potential deficiency that I was unable to verify because they were fire stopped before I arrived. So seeing all steps, even if multiple contractors are used in one condition has to be done. So it does say when schedule five pipe sleeve or EMT is used, sleeve may extend up to 18 inches beyond the wall surface. As an option, Sleeve makes then continuously beyond one wall surface when steel pipe or EMT is used. So let's just catch something here for a second. It did not say the word 28 gauge or this sheet metal sleeve. So when that thinner gauge sleeve is used, it could not extend past the wall. When it does extend past the wall, I'm limited to only 18 inches. So that sounds pretty far. But again, it's not great. So these sleeves are extending out maybe an inch or two. I don't know what the other size is, but it's saying it can be continuous on one side because most conduits run continuously through a building and come to an end somewhere. Again, but I'm limited to 18 inches out on one way. So, well, no, Brent, I ran 15 feet down the corridor and dropped it into a cable tray. Do I need to fire stop that? Is that acceptable? It's whatever, it's 15 feet that way, who cares? 
Not my call as a special inspector to verify that. It's a great question to ask your authority having jurisdiction. All I can tell you from the document you handed me and got approved, it limits us to 18 inches here. So let's take a look at how those sleeves or conduits are extended throughout the construction. It then says when a cable bundle penetrates the wall assembly at an angle of 45 degrees, no metallic sleeve is used. So kind of limiting here, but my cables can come through without a sleeve at an angle. So after that, it does talk about the cables themselves. We see that we get a max 45% of area of opening of a fill ratio. So the cables are limited to how many we can have through the penetration itself. That's very common terminology. That number varies from every system. The annular space between the cable bundle and the periphery of the opening, meaning if no sleeve was used, is minimum point contact zero to max one inch. So that, that sounds you know, reasonable, but you'd be quite surprised that many times that's a hard thing to achieve. So one inch, it's, it's reasonable. Uh, what I watch out here for is again, continuous point contact. So I'm gonna pull up a bad photo. Remember, this is a bad installation. But as you can see in my photo here is my cable bundle on the left has no sleeve and it's more than 45% vis visually filled right away. I can I see I potentially have a problem. There is a way to calculate that if you remember. And my angular space looks to be zero to one inch, but if it touches more than one area, as in it looks like it's touching here and it's potentially touching up here, that's more than one area as a point contact, that would be a deficiency. So again, not a compliant installation. Just wanted to show you a photo of just running cables and cutting holes doesn't always work. Uh, so that does say when a sleeve is, con is continuous on one side of the wall, the fill may be zero to 45% max. And the max angular space is not limited. So again, let's go back to our picture of the bunch of cable sleeves here. So that means if the sleeve is not continuous and it's a sleeve open on both sides, I am limited to an angular space of zero to one and a 45% fill ratio. So if I look at this photo here and just eyeball on it again, this measurement from cable to sleeve cannot be more than one, which it sure looks like I am on both these areas. If the sleeve is continuous on the other side of the wall, then it is no limitation to angular space. So I could be zero to 45% and my angular space can be uh, as max as you want, like as long as the sleeve does not exceed four inches. So in this case, this blank sleeve right here could be compliant with that system if the other side of the wall is a continuous conduit. These ones could be non-compliant just by angular space, not the fill ratio potentially. Who knows all three of them? Again, the cables is the next part that we're gonna read the fine print on. It says now the cables to be rigidly supported on both sides of the wall assembly. So from that photo, you can clearly see I don't see any sort of supporting of these cables. Looks like they just go straight down. Now, they might not be fully set. What I'm trying to say by that is the fire stop shall provide no support. So once I install my fire stop around these cables and we removed the cables, let's say, I mean the fire stop, the cables do not move. So the idea is that the cables meet their own or the penetration itself meets its own local building code for supports. What we don't want to see is the fire stop holding up in any way that installation. So what I see here is a bunch of cables going four different ways. This is me looking at the end of a sleeve. Cables going this way, that way, this way. I don't think those are potentially rigidly supported themselves. And now the fire stop most likely is incorrectly installed because there's no way to properly do it and it's supporting the cables in some way as these turn down. So I have a photo from this side that clearly shows there was no fire stop behind these cables because they were turning as they come right out of the sleeve. And also we had three points of point contact. So again, aesthetics doesn't so much matter, it's just a photo that kind of shows the cable layout affected everything else. So then it talks about all the different types of cables you can have. Again, the systems are always specific. This allows Cat5, Cat6 cables, different size cables, MC cables, SER power cables, all different types of cables are called out here. Uh, the simple request is, Brent, this is, this is overwhelming to me, I'm new. Okay, the installing contractor should be able to provide their cut sheet of what's in that sleeve. 
Oh, Brent, it's being shared with three different contractors. Well, sorry, if three different contractors are sharing the sleeve, the three different contractors need to verify their cable type to the one Firestop system that one installer is doing. We don't want three different people installing Firestop at the end of that sleeve. And that's the problem with these conditions is many times different vendors are coming in throughout the project and adding more. So you could inspect something today, looks great, and then a week later, a different vendor comes in, digs the firecock out, and runs one more cable in there. So a great example of uh, kind of some challenges with visual inspection of these that, that, that takes so long to get everybody's cables through these sleeves or openings before they're finally done. And many times people want to do their fire stop much sooner than that. So we verify the cabling type, we verify the fill ratio, the angular space, uh, and then we finally get down to the fire stopping material 15 minutes later. So it talks about material applied within the angles flush with the end of the steel sleeve or wall surface. Fill material is applied on both sides of the wall. A minimum 5 8 thickness is applied uh, into the opening for one and two hour walls. An additional half inch bead of material is applied at point contact locations, which can be in one area. Then it says you can use CP601S, 606, FS1, FS1 Max, or 618 Putty. So a good amount of materials are being called out here. But again, those are flush, not saying it has to be perfect like the drawing. Remember, there's going to be a little bit of a, a concave shape or overlap onto the cables or wall assembly or excess material. Our focus, though, is that the materials are being recessed properly at least 5 eighths into the angular space wherever that is present. And at a half inch at point contact to create a continuous seal around these cables. It does say the packing material is optional. Uh, but it does call out mineral wool forming material may be used as a backer. So if our angular space is large or we're just kind of you know, new to these areas, hey, sure, use backing. But in this case, mineral wool is listed, meaning, well, Brent, can I use fiberglass? In this case, great question to ask your authority having jurisdiction, but I go the most stringent design. The word backing says optional, but it does limit me to mineral wool. So the type of mineral we'll use might not be a big deal, but we need to focus on what's listed there. So with that, that was an exercise kind of walking through the steps and nomenclature that you're going to find within a listed through penetration system. Remember, there's a lot more than just the fire stopping installation of our checks and balances that should be done prior to the installation, hopefully. If we're doing destructive testing, we're going to be limited on some of these areas, but usually you can still see a good amount of that information. So just having the contractor vet the system, hopefully before your inspection is always a helpful exercise and asking for elements like the product data sheet of the cabling being used in this sleeve is a great question hopefully you can ask uh, ahead of your inspection. So with that, the International Fire, uh, Fire Stop Council and FireWise Consultants wants to thank you for attending this webinar and let you know that at firestop.org, the IFC has additional webinar series about other types of Firestop systems and how to read them. So we do perimeter containment like slab edge, we do joints in the interior of the building, and we do recessed membrane box uh, protection. So those are all found at firestop.org. And if you need further questions or clarification, you're more than welcome to reach out to myself, Brent Johnson of Firewise Consultants, or the International Firestop Council as our contact information is found here on the screen. And with that, we wanna thank you for attending this webinar and have a great day.